CBS 4 News. This is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning. I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. This was a sad and tragic week for law enforcement as two FBI agents, Laura Schwarzenberger and Daniel Alfin, were shot to death trying to serve a search warrant in a child pornography investigation. Three other agents were wounded. George Pirro, the special agent in charge of the FBI office in South Florida, had this to say about the shooting. Dan and Laura left home this morning to carry out the mission they signed up for and loved to do, to keep the American people safe. They were valuable members of the FBI and will forever be heroes. We will always honor their ultimate sacrifice. Schwarzenberger was the mother of two. Alfin leaves behind a one-year-old. It was one of the deadliest shootings in FBI history and brought to mind the 1986 murder of two FBI agents at Sunnyline Shopping Center in what is now Pinecrest. Late this week, I spoke to a retired FBI agent, Richard Stout, who worked with both Laura and Daniel. As a senior agent, you uh, are, are watching the the newer agents coming up and working and making decision on whether or not you want to work with these people. Um, and they, they, they were definite. They were, they checked all the boxes. Uh, I knew Laura, um, longer than I did Dan. I, and I didn't know Dan that well. Um, but, uh, what I knew I liked. Um, he was a conversational guy. Um, and, always working hard, always, you know, you come in in the morning and, and, and those folks uh, over in Innocent Images are always working uh, when, in the morning and then when you leave at night, they're, they're still there working, hammering away. Tell me a little bit more about Laura. So I knew Laura a little bit better than, than I knew Dan. Um, she was at the field office, uh, I think around starting 2009, and um, she had come from another division. Uh, Albuquerque. Uh, now, what's interesting about Laura was that uh, she was on a SWAT team in, in that division. And, but when she came here to Miami, nobody knew who she was. Uh, so she shows up on the firing range and uh, she shoots a perfect score. And uh, so no one knows who this new agent is, uh, but obviously she's very capable and she proved herself capable over the next 11 years by taking on multiple duties. She was on the dive team for um, uh, evidence recovery. Uh, she, she was a diligent worker when it came to um, her work with innocent images and child pornography cases. Um, very, very serious about her craft um, and very methodical is, is something I would, how I describe it. I got to imagine that that work when you're dealing with, you know, exploited children or trying to solve the crimes related to them, that, that's, that's particularly tough. I got to imagine it takes its emotional toll on, on agents. That's not easy. That's not an easy assignment within the Bureau, is it? I think those agents are the hardest working agents in the, in the Bureau. And uh, they are faced with going in day after day after day, reviewing images and building cases against uh, these, these pedophiles and criminals and people who, who you know, we, we don't want in our neighborhoods, we don't want in our community. And uh, they are relentless in the pursuit of these people. And uh, to, to not only be able to conduct those investigations, but to continue several years, just shows you how resolute these, these individuals are. I know from uh, reading about Dan that uh that you know, he was singularly focused in terms of his computer skills and being able to really do the type of work. I know that he had made major cases you know, in and around the country and that this was something that he felt very strongly and passionate about. And I guess it takes that level of passion you know, in, in all things, but particularly in areas like this for both of them, I would imagine. Yeah, I agree with that. Again, I, I can't tell you uh, anecdotal stories about, about Dan. But um, uh, what I knew I liked, and um, again, he was an approachable guy. And uh, I, it, it, my feeling would be if I, if I needed him, uh, he would be one of those guys who would be a phone call away if I needed to put a team together. 
I know in our earlier conversations, you talked a little bit about uh, one of the things that, that, that sticks in your head. It's little things sometimes. Uh, Laura's laugh, for instance. What, what, what do you remember about that? Laura, Laura had this unusual laugh. It was more, I guess, more akin to a cackle. And um, you, you either knew that Laura was in the room or that she was approaching the room. And, um, you know, maybe in the beginning, it, it's a little off-putting, but after a while, it's just, you know, that was just one of her things. And, and it was funny. And, uh, and if I ever heard her laugh, I would just uh, sort of chuckle to myself while, while I was doing my job working at my desk. The FBI and law enforcement in general is a close-knit family, and I'm, I'm sure when you hear about any, any member of law enforcement, local police, state police, who are, who are shot or killed in the line of duty, that, that you, you feel that, that pain for them as, as, a, you know, as part, of the, part of the family of law enforcement. But when it's an FBI agent, because there have not been many FBI agents uh, killed, sure. does, it, does it hit you a little different? Well, this is, I guess this is unusual in the sense that it is an F, you know, these are FBI agents that were killed, um, that they were uh, people that I knew within my field office, uh, and I worked, I worked with them, and uh, I knew these people. Um, it's, it's a risk that all law enforcement officers take. Um, I think they were well trained. Uh, I just think the circumstances lend itself to a situation uh, with uh, the, the the just the the unknowns were were there and and uh, in hindsight we will figure out as an institution what exactly uh, went right and what what went wrong. Are you confident in that? You confident that in in a case like this that the due diligence will be met and that that there will be lessons that will learn and probably changes that will as a result as as a result of their deaths. Sure. For example, we could go back to 1986 to uh, uh, Ben Grogan and Jerry Dove, and that was the, the Miami shootout back then. And uh, that's uh, one of the problems that, that happened with, with that shooting is uh, that the agents were simply outgunned. And so it was um, in the aftermath of that shooting and a, and a very hard look by the FBI to make the change over to uh, semi-automatic weapons. And... Uh, not only did we do that, but uh, many agencies uh, followed our direction. And uh, that's why most agencies you see now uh, are outfitted with um, uh, Glocks, uh, some form of semi-automatic weapon. Yeah, as opposed to the old days where you had 38 revolvers. You know, exactly. you went from the revolver to either the, the nine millimeter or the Glock or whatever it might be, but something that carries more bullets. Because again, that as you talk about the Sunnyland case from from the 80s, 35 years ago, you know, that was a case where seven agents were shot and wounded, two of them killed, as you said, Grogan and, and Dove, you know, trying to arrest two serial bank robbers. So they clearly had a numbers advantage, but yet firepower is where they were, they were lacking. And that's where they got, that got caught. We won't know exactly what happened here, but I would imagine those same sorts of reviews will take place, as you said. Well, I, I know that the inspection team has already left headquarters, and uh, they're they're conducting interviews, and it's it's basically an after action report of uh, the shooting, and uh, they're they're going to be interviewing people, uh, they're going to be looking at the ops plan, and uh, they're going to be asking some hard questions. Our thoughts are with the families of Daniel and Laura. May their memories bring them some comfort. We'll be right back. 